Hi, Ozzy here. A friend and fellow YouTuber who's planning on making a video about bad arguments in online discussions between theists and atheists invited people to provide examples of such bad arguments for him on his Facebook page. And I listed a half dozen or so bad arguments for him, which uh, immediately sprang to my mind, including a claim I hear made by many of my fellow proponents of evolution, namely, nothing in the biological world is designed. Things only look designed. And that's something I think is incorrect. Now, another friend of mine responded in that Facebook thread with the following, and I quote him here verbatim with his permission. He wrote, <clears throat> Ozzy, I have to disagree with you on design. The word, when used by evolutionists, seems to be to be merely a placeholder term. I have winced when I've seen Dawkins and Hitchens use the term in debates with creationists. I'm surprised the creationists didn't use it as a gotcha moment. I feel that the word and its usage are a hangover from our everyday experiences. The word rolls off the tongue. In the context of evolutionary biology, developed is a much better word than designed. Leave design to the realm of conscious design, where it belongs. And he went on to add, by all means, refer to the appearance of design, but to call it design sends out completely the wrong signal, in my opinion." End quote. Now, I think my friend expressed quite well a, a fairly commonly held opinion and some of the motivating reasons why one might be tempted to deny that there is design in the biological world. And it's this idea that nothing in the biological world is actually designed that I want to address and challenge in this video. But before I go on, I want to emphasize that this video is addressed to my fellow proponents of evolutionary theory, not to creationists. It's not intended to establish the fact of evolution, but to clear up what I think is a fairly common misunderstanding on the part of many proponents of evolutionary theory when they enter into discussions with creationists. So to begin, ordinarily when we speak of designs or of something being designed, we're usually referring to human manufactured artifacts, intentional planned objects or systems created for certain purposes and made specifically to execute certain functions. For example, when I go on a camping trip, I'll sometimes fashion my own tent stakes or tent pegs by whittling pieces of wood I found along the way. My prior intention, the purpose that I have in mind, and the way the tent stake will serve its function is prefigured in my mind, and that anticipated use and functionality guide and inform how I carve and shape the wood so that it will be of a certain size and have a point on one end and a carved notch in the other end where a rope or a guy line can be attached. The purpose that I have in mind is logically prior to the creation of the artifact and that purpose, that end, is operative in the very act of manufacturing it. This is an example of what's known as a teleological design. The intended purpose or anticipated function precedes, logically speaking, the creation of the artifact. And that logically prior intention is part of the causal explanation for why the artifact exhibits the specific properties which it has. If the prior intention hadn't existed, the object would not have the specific qualities and features that it has. It wouldn't even exist. So no description of my creation of that tent stake would be complete without some mention of my goals and intentions and purposes for it. You could, in principle, give an exhaustive description of the proximate physical actions, the minutia of the processes involved in the carving of my tent stake. But if you neglected to mention what my purposes and intentions were before and during the act of carving them, you'd be leaving something relevant out of the explanatory account. Because my intentions and purposes, the very design that I have in mind as I'm carving, are what determine what specifically I do to the wood and how it turns out. They are antecedent or prior causes. If I hadn't had those intentions, if I'd had different intentions and purposes, or even if I'd had a different shape in mind, the manufactured object would have come out quite differently. So that's what's meant by teleological design, a design resulting from teleology. But philosophers and evolutionary biologists have, since Darwin's discovery of the principle of natural selection, recognize that there are, within the biological world, features which have properties that look 
at least superficially, like they're teleologically designed, but are the result of non-purposive, unintended forces and blind causes. The principle of natural selection can explain a great many biological adaptations, which one would otherwise assume are teleologically designed. The emergence of sensory organs, for instance, within animal lineages, or the development of immunities to antibiotics in bacterial species, or the capacity for some plants to develop a tolerance to live in soils contaminated by heavy metals. Um, uh, even behavioral dispositions and instincts, such as emotional states or uh, a beaver's ability to build dams, admit, in principle, of explanations that don't require a conscious agent to explain why the organisms exhibit the features they do. These are known as teleonomic designs. Tele teleonomic design requires nothing more than that a biological trait or feature is suitable, relative to some interest an organism has, for reliably bringing about an advantageous result. The reliability of such an advantageous result, if it's heritable, is what ensures that the trait or feature will persist across the generations. If an organismal trait or feature is heritable, and is suitable to serve the needs of that organism, such that it improves the organism's comparative rate of reproductive success, out-reproducing others within its own population, then that fact alone suffices to explain why, in the next generation, the genes for that trait will enjoy a somewhat greater representation than other genes for other traits, and why the trait will enjoy continued existence and spread throughout the population over time perhaps even becoming fixed or universal in the population. So traits which are fitness conferring, though unintended and unplanned and unpurposed, nevertheless serve the interests of the organism, just as surely as they would serve the organism if they'd had those traits put there by some purposive agent. This is what's meant by teleonomy or teleonomic design, a design that serves actual purposes but the designed features require no prior intentions, no intentions in action, no purpose sir needs to be invoked to explain the trait or feature in question. A purposive agent would just be a redundancy in the explanation of the design trait whenever a teleonomic account would suffice. And this is why evolutionists such as Richard Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould and others, or philosophers such as Daniel Dennett, don't feel any need to deny there is design in nature at all. We can see, we can see that organisms have well-designed bodies, organs, systems, behaviors, and instincts. We can see that these all serve the interests of the critter in question in its local environment, and we've discovered for many such traits that they arose piecemeal, gradually over time. And these design traits can even fall into disuse lose their functionality and purpose when local circumstances change, as we find in the, in the case of cave fish, who, being descendants of fish who did live in ordinary light conditions, um, have completely non-functional eyes now. They have eyes, they just don't work anymore, because having gradually moved into an ecological niche that has no light at all, their eyes cease to be of any reproductive advantage. And with that selective pressure removed, fish with very bad and ever worsening vision were no longer at any disadvantage. There being no purpose in having eyes, no use or function for eyes, individuals born with bad eyes, or blind for that matter, were not weeded out. So, prior to Darwin, when people spoke of design, they of course had in mind teleology. But Darwin showed how there are two types of design, teleological and teleonomic. The term teleonomy was coined only a century later, though. Teleonomic designs are really designs, being shaped, augmented, improved, sometimes nearly perfected under strong environmental pressures. Though often the designs are suboptimal with many inefficiencies because the forces shaping the designs are simply environmental pressures, which are blind, mindless, and so ruthlessly indifferent. The fact that organismal traits serve the organism's reproductive interests is relevant here, 
it's relevant in any explanation of how, of how these traits got there and are the way they are. If the organism had different needs and interests, the adaptive traits would be other than what they are. Eyes are for seeing, and that's why eyes could never evolve in species which live with, where no light penetrates. Though eyes could cease to be functional where they serve no purpose, as happened with cavefish. Eyes, even in less impressive forms, found in some of our most remote ancestors were, at every stage of their evolution, suitable to the interests and needs of our ancestors, conferring some reproductive benefit and advantage to our ancestors. The suitability of the eyes for seeing, the adequacy of that design with respect to seeing, is what explains why we are going to pass them on to our descendants. It might be unplanned and unintended, but it's not some accident or coincidence that we have eyes. Eyes are good for seeing. That's their purpose, their function. Their being good for seeing, their function, functional utility is causally relevant, is actually part of the explanatory account of why we have eyes. Teleonomic design is design, just mindless. A huge difficulty here, of course, is that most people are unfamiliar with the concept of teleonomic design. And most of the time, when we speak of design, we, of course, have in mind teleological purposive designs, the kinds of things we do. Unfortunately, this leads some proponents of evolution to think that the only legitimate usage of the word design is when we speak of teleological or purposive designs. And so they think that when biologists speak of design in nature, they are merely speaking figuratively or metaphorically or sloppily of things which merely seem designed. That's incorrect. My wife was an evolutionary biologist for many years, and so I spent a good deal of time in the company, both socially and professionally, of evolutionary biologists. And they spoke unabashedly about designs in the biological world. They were not allergic to the word. They didn't shy away from it. They didn't think that they were merely borrowing the word or using it figuratively or sloppily. Indeed, they understand that the most interesting thing about evolutionary theory is that it explains those organismal features or traits which very obviously are designed. Just ask yourself, what the heck is the principle of natural selection for, except to explain precisely those organismal features which are adaptive, which serve the organism's interests, which make an organism's traits well suited to its local environment. It's a theory of how organismal traits are shaped by successive cumulative improvements under selective pressures because they reliably and predictably contribute to the reproductive success of the organism. It's a theory of design, about design, to explain design. It explains biological traits which are adaptive, and lots of non-adaptive and some maladaptive traits too, I might add. So evolutionary biology is that branch of biology which deals most directly with the explanation of traits which have adaptive functions. And adaptations serve organisms serve their reproductive interests by serving their more immediate needs. Adaptations serve functions and so have purpose for the organism. So today we have two concepts of design, teleological and teleonomic. And if we insist that the only correct usage of design is teleological, then we end up forced to deny the very phenomena of interest to biologists and which natural selection can often explain designed organismal features. So why would anyone deny it in the first place? Well, people who shy away from acknowledging the design that's observable in the biological world are typically motivated by a concern that creationists, if they hear us speak of design, will declare victory, will invoke the dictum that every design implies a designer. But one should only be reluctant to affirm that dictum if, like creationists who say it, we leap to the unwarranted conclusion that the design, and therefore the designer, must be teleological rather than teleonomic. That's a non sequitur. The antidote to that sort of inferential leap is to understand and explain that some designs are teleological and some are teleonomic. Some designers, such as ourselves when we create things, are teleological designers, while natural selection is a teleonomic designer. But if we go around saying things like, no, there's no such thing as design in the biological world, or 
hands aren't designed for grasping, we sound foolish. Hands with opposable thumbs clearly are designed for grasping. And when we deny it, we're denying what's plain for all to see. What's not plain, though, is which sort of design is responsible. Design is not a word we should be prepared to surrender to creationists just because we disagree with the argument from design. It's important here to, to understand that the argument from design is supposed to be a teleological argument, an argument that goes from teleological design to a teleological designer. But if creationists want to insist that the argument from design implies a teleological designer, they need to establish that the designs that we see in the biological world are teleological designs, not just assume this or declare them to be. One can grant that every design implies a designer. I know I do. But granting that leaves unanswered the question of whether the designer is an intelligent and purposive planner or just a teleonomic, blind causal process. The slogan, every design implies a designer, doesn't imply, require, or necessitate teleological design. Consequently, we should readily acknowledge the existence of good design, exquisite design, suboptimal design, and even bad design in the biological world. In fact, as the evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould was fond of reminding the public, some of the best evidence for natural selection is to be found in all the examples of suboptimal, bad, and inefficient designs. Imperfect, inefficient, and clumsy designs make so much more sense if the designer is a mindless and indifferent set of selective pressures which altogether constitute a selective standard for organisms against which some individuals will leave more surviving offspring than others, resulting in the accumulation of fitness conferring traits across generations within a population. Such a process will produce many, predictably, suboptimal designs, but even a bad design is still a design. So to conclude, what I'm recommending is that we shouldn't be repudiating the word or concept of design in the biological world just because the word connotes teleology to most people, especially when doing so makes us look like we're denying what everyone knows in their bones to be true. Living things exhibit all sorts of design, good and bad. The only way people will come to have a more accurate, sophisticated, and scientifically informed concept of design is if we embrace the term and take the trouble to explain that there's more than one kind of design. Every design needs a designer, is true. But that doesn't get creationists to the conclusion they want. And so we needn't be concerned about acknowledging the existence of design in the biological world. Okay, that's all for now. I hope this helps, and thank you for listening.